It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 272 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday the 16th of July 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr. Shane Joseph. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey. And the only reason that we're here is because of the generosity of people like Ryan James, Dan Kruger, Brett Henry, EJ, Chris Curtin McGee, Sean McElligot, Richard Sutherland and Pete Ellinger. All fantastic people who have chipped in some coin to help us out. So if you like what we do, you can join their esteemed ranks. Just go to scienceontop.com slash donate. But first, have a listen to the show. Uh, and Shane, welcome back. You've just been on a holiday, haven't you? Yeah, look, it was just for a week. I needed to escape Melbourne because if anyone who lives in Melbourne right now can attest, it's it's cold. Yeah, uh, I was, uh, <laughs> was going <laughs> to... <yeah. laughs> I was wondering, how's he going to how's he going to get through this particular sentence without swearing? <laughs> yeah, he <pretty laughs> did. I, I did. I did. Um, yeah, basically. Um, and to be honest, while Queensland was nice and all, coming back to Melbourne was just it was such a shock to the system. Like you're joking, right? I got off the plane and I was like, "Are you actually serious? I can see my breath. What the <laughs> hell? Like, come on!" <laughs> and yeah, but I spent you know the last few days up in Cairns for a couple of days. Then we went to uh, one of the Great Barrier Reef Islands, Fitzroy Island. Um, yeah, it was beautiful, but kind of disheartening. Oh, why disheartening? Well, uh, because uh, unlike what Paul and Hanson would, t- would tell you, um, the reef is actually, it's not the, it's not dead yet, but it's definitely dying and it's sad. It's not as colourful as I remember it being when I went a few years ago, even just a few short years ago. Um the bleaching is it's pretty bad. And you went to the same area? No, well we went to, no, um to be honest, no. Um mm-hmm. but I've I but I've we talked to people there who was like who were saying, Yeah, the, the the coral is definitely bleaching. Whether or not they believe that's because of climate change or not, I don't know. I didn't ask because I've learned the hard way that you don't get into those conversations with people. <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, it's look, I mean amongst the beautiful colours and the turtles and stuff, there is still a lot of dead coral. And you can even see, like, I remember reading something about how, um, because the coral's dying, um, fish are basically sort of sitting there trying to eat at it, but they get into the rock, into the rock underneath instead. And so they're chipping away at the rock, and because of that, they're providing less, fewer and fewer services for the remaining coral to grow on and it's just oh, yeah like a negative feedback yeah it's and i could see it i could see these parrotfish and stuff just sitting there just chewing away at the rock going, oh god that's terrible so this yeah. place has really gone downhill they were saying to themselves <laughs> yeah pretty much yeah food used to be great here now it just tastes like i don't know rock it like rock <laughs> yeah yeah um well yeah that is quite depressing um sorry to bring sorry to bring it down into the proceedings <laughs> I, I... <laughs> you've ruined everything mm. Uh, but it was interesting, Shane, that you mentioned feedback loops because this week we also saw another uh, side effect of the climate change feedback that's been happening, which was the splitting of a giant iceberg the size of Delaware from Antarctica. Now, like I said, we've known for a while that this was sort of coming, but to actually see an iceberg 60 times the size of Paris break away, it's a really serious problem. <clears throat> So we know that it's the size of the Greek island of Crete, but can you tell us what we all really want to know here is how many Olympic-sized swimming pools it would fill. I'm sorry, all the coverage I've seen of this has been some sort of a comparison to something Apparently huge. quarter, uh, I think quarter of the size of Wales as well, I think that yep. came up. See, that means Maybe. nothing to me because I have no idea how big Delaware is, nor, nor how big Wales is. Yeah, I, which I, whale were I, they talking about? Well, yeah, exactly. Oh. You know? And how many? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> However, the answer is 462 million Olympic swimming pools, just to get <laughs> And again, that means bugger all to me. (laughs) But I think that's kind of the point, is that this is an unimaginably huge block of ice. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 
Yes, I agree. Although <coughs> the scientists don't seem to be attributing it to climate change, this particular oh, really? one. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're, so it, it, it is, I mean, it's possible for sure uh, and, and, <coughs> and quite you know, feasible that uh, climate change may have been involved in this particular one, but they did say that, you know, carvings of this nature, whilst rare, do occur, um, and they are a part of that natural cycle. And the previous collapses of Larsen A and Larsen B ice shelves were um, were linked to climate change, um, and they were, you know, unprecedented as well. But this one, yeah, not not exactly. And and the other thing I guess that's good about this is that um, it was already floating. So this this carving doesn't mean sea level rise at all because it was already floating like an ice block. So oh, so it was just uh, a big piece that was already in the sea, and now it's just split. Yeah, split in two. Right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you know, it the biggest concern. With with things like this is what uh, effect they'll have on the on the glaciers that feed these ice shelves because they basically act like a big dam and they hold them back. So if one of these breaks off, you know, to such a large degree, then um, it can it can cause the the slippage of that glacier to to accelerate, and that is a really big concern because this is not. Sea ice. This is not ice that's in the in you know that, that's in the water already. So that would have an impact on um, on sea levels. But yeah, you know, it's it seems all the coverage that I read, although there was certainly um, a lot of the mainstream media, you know, were, were talking about climate change, yet another step, blah blah blah. More more of the science based um, sites and so forth that I that I read about this were were talking about that. Yeah, this this particular event, um, whilst you know, potentially linked to uh, to climate change is not, you know, is not obviously so, and could just be a part of the natural cycle. So, so they they weren't overly concerned, and they and as I say, they weren't overly concerned about the size of it and, and whatever because it was already it was already sea ice effectively, but it does represent potentially um, a future shipping hazard because uh, something that this big, mm-hmm. um, it, it it hangs around for a long time. So. If it does drift north, um, it could it could end up in in um, you know in areas that that um, are frequented by uh, all sorts of shipping. Um, it will eventually break up as well, and then we could end up with a whole lot of icebergs, um, you know, all over the damn place. And I, I think of the. Do you remember a number of years ago? It's probably quite some time ago now, but it sprang, sprang to mind when I was reading about the breaking up risk. Uh, well, not risk, certainty. Um, of the, do you remember there was, um, I think there was a shipping container or something that went overboard that was full of rubber ducks, mm-hmm. you know, like mm-hmm. 10, oh, yeah. 15 years ago or something. Yeah. Or other. And these things actually became um, a, a, a very interesting study in sea currents because they turned up all over the world. They were everywhere. <laughs> and they were they were distinct. And, you know, like they'd, they'd turn up in batches on, on beaches and in bays and all sorts of things all over the place. So it actually gave uh, a really cool way to track you know the the uh, the currents and and I had coincidentally been reading a little bit more about this because of the um, was it the MH seventy or whatever I forgot which, oh, yeah. which yeah the Malaysian Airlines one that disappeared over the Indian Ocean mm-hmm. there was a uh, some recent coverage that um, had come out of CSIRO about the um, modelling they had done of sea currents as well. Um, to try and narrow down the the search area for for that uh, for the wreck, and they think they've got it, you know, quite narrowed down now after a whole lot of extensive, you know, modelling of the of the currents. But you know, kind of kind of shows you that it's it's a such a variable system that when something like this occurs and you end up with this massive um, ice sheet, um, that that uh, eventually it'll start cracking up, and we could end up with bits of it going in all sorts of different directions. Mm. Um, so that that could become quite a risk. But and, and that's. Um, a big worry though because of course when you get cold water that goes into your more warmer water streams and things you can end up sh- shutting down some of those currents and affecting huge uh yeah on- true but problems. again yeah again it's not um if you were to dump that amount of 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 cold water into an area of ocean all at once then that would certainly be that would certainly be a, a concern, but they don't they don't thaw instantly. You know, they mm. they they take months, sometimes years, to to break up, and then each mm. then individual piece that carves off the the main one then slowly melts. So, 
Yes, but n- not likely to be a problem with this, from what I've read. Um, you know, and and more than happy <clears> to be corrected on that. But that that appears not to be a, a major issue either. So basically, you know, uh, the the scientists are sort of saying it, it's it's really interesting. It's it's very um, cool to watch. It wasn't completely unexpected because, you know, there was a. Uh, they've been tracking this for a number of years and there, there's actually some time-lapse videos on various sites that are probably in the links you'll, you'll include anyway, but we will have to now, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but um, um, those, there are various uh, things that you can see going right back to about 2014 or so when this crack, I think, started um, and started spreading and, and it had, you know, various points at which there was not much observation. So, you know, it would suddenly jump in between observation cycles and so forth. There's also some footage of um, of aircraft flying over and filming it and whatever and 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 apparently towards the end there was a, a rapid sort of it's like it was it was hanging on by barely anything and there was a very rapid spread of a, of the cracking but they said once once the crack would hit fairly soft areas of ice that are less brittle it would slow down um, for a period of time until it found a path through it and and then occasionally it would branch off, and then the branch would actually accelerate the the, the cracking and all that sort of thing. But uh, but yeah, as I say, um, it doesn't appear to be a, a major a major cause for concern based on what I've read. Um, mm-hmm. Certainly, when I first heard of it, I expected um, well, I, I just assumed it was a um, you know a climate change link and whatever. And as yeah. I say, it, it could be contributing, but it doesn't you know it doesn't seem that there's a, a clear link in this case. It's interesting, though, that we can see the earlier carvings with Larson A and B, and we are fairly confident that they were climate change related, but we're yeah, and also yeah, not, I agree. we don't think the C one is. So that's a bit weird. Yes, I agree. I did. I think I also thought that was quite interesting because I, I, I didn't read anything that delved into exactly how they know mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. difference. Um so it might be something to do with the speed of at which it, it, it accelerated or, or whatever. I'm not really sure. But, yeah, I, I didn't come across that either, so I can't really comment. Oh, it is interesting. But um, it's also good to, I think, be the word of caution when the first thing any media organisation does is without doing a proper investigation is just link it to climate change or link it to a big catastrophe when it's probably not all that bad. We need to keep an eye on the glaciers, but... Otherwise, it's probably not the end of the world yet. <laughs> well, it's yeah. funny because you you see, like even even some of the the more science um, you know focused websites that I read about this on, um, when they they did take the time to explain that it, that it didn't appear to be a, a climate change caused situation, but then started talking about the US pulling out of the Paris Accord and stuff. Like mm-hmm. it's all. You know, it's obviously there was it was hard to avoid getting into climate change, and and I mean it's relevant, obviously, but um, but yeah, I I, I thought, oh, okay, why are we suddenly talking about that? I, I know it's it's absurd, and I know it's it should be spoken about, but yeah, it wasn't sort of necessarily directly linked, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, yeah. better off just focusing on the size, which is twenty five times as big as Buenos Aires. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a million of times. stats if you want. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. But, uh, let's turn our attention now to the age-old war between plants and insects. Now, it doesn't really seem like an even fight. Plants can't exactly run away, and not that many of them have teeth they can fight back with. But integrative biologist John Oric and his colleagues at the University of Wisconsin have found that tomato plants, when under attack release a chemical that turns caterpillars into cannibals. Yeah. Shane, is this another reason we should be wary of vegans? Is it contagious? <laughs> Can humans get this too as well? Don't, 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 don't lead off with that because you know I'm just going to get in trouble. <laughs> God. <laughs> um, but funny you were talking about the way um, new sites sort of beat things up. Last thing we talked about was, you know, the whole linking of climate change to something that isn't necessarily a climate change related problem. And this is a case where I'm going to, I'm going to be a bit nitpicky here. Plants don't turn caterpillars into cannibals. Okay. You heard it here uh, first. You're saying they just, they just encourage them to to embrace their cannibal nature? Well, yeah, you know. (laughs) Anyway, um, so basically caterpillars are naturally cannibalistic anyway. 
Really? Um, yes, they are. Um, well, they, oh, oh, well they, wow. they, they, these species are anyway. Basically, and I think a lot of insects are like that. Apparently, um, locusts, for example, if they... Because, you, know, you know, it is a bit of a tangent, but it sort of makes sense. Um, it, when, like, when locusts swarm, if they don't reach the next patch of, you know, available biomass in time and they fall to the ground, they have no energy to turn to fly anymore, they will turn on each other and they will tear each other apart, even though they're, herb- even though they're herbivores. Um, this is... Yeah, this is it's interesting. Like the, the whole the demarcation between a herbivore and a, and a carnivore is not necessarily as strict as you think it is. Um, and yeah, cannibals, uh, cannibals, caterpillars do exactly the same thing. What's interesting is when they'll be ca- cannibalistic because it's better for them. And in this case, what plants will do as a way to stop themselves from being eaten? And Ed, Ed mentioned this: that plants can't fight back. Well, they can actually fight back because plants have been around since, you know, well, long, long, long before an- well, animals were even around and they've evolved with animals that are, that attack them all the time and they've developed this, uh, through evolution, this arsenal of ways to protect themselves against insects. One way is fairly common. It's um, this chemical that Ed mentioned called, it's called methyl jasminate and basically is a signal to other plants in the area. It's a bit like when I've talked in the past about quorum sensing. Um, it's basically a signal to say, hey, something's happening. When it reaches a certain level in the environment, it will trigger genes in plants that will produce toxins, and that makes the plants much less nutritious for the attacking insects to eat. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what they did in this study was, first they demonstrated this behavior that they've already known about for a while, I think, um, where they, they basically exposed lab tomato plants to methyl jasmine. So they, they didn't allow the plants to just produce it themselves. They actually sprayed it on them. Mm-hmm. And then they exposed caterpillars of the small willow moth to these plants. The control group obviously didn't receive the treatment and the um, experimental group did. And they found that the exposed plants lost about five times less biomass to caterpillar loss than the control group, which they I think they expected. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> then they... Did the same. They tested this whole cannibalistic idea. They took a single caterpillar, put it into a container, um, put it, a live one, sorry, and they put a number of dead ones with it. They don't, I think they don't really say how much, but anyway. And then they treated different caterpillar containers with different leaf types, like ones that had been treated with the methyl jasminate and ones that hadn't been. And what they found was that the caterpillars that ate the treated leaves, ate more of their dead counterparts earlier and more of them. So 7% versus 16%. Now, this is not because, this is as far as I understand it, this is not because the toxins, the methyl jasminate triggers a cannibalistic nature. It's because the plant's matter is inedible to them. Yeah, that's exactly what it sounded like to me. So they they, they taste bad or for some reason they don't want to eat the plant. Yeah. They have to eat something. They have to get energy from somewhere and they'll turn yeah. on the other cattle. They'll turn on the dick mouse, yeah. I guess it's not like they can just, you know, really easily relocate to another tree. Like no. They're pretty slow. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, yeah, exactly. They're not butterflies or moths yet. They can't fly. So they have to crawl along. Mm. And, yeah, they've only got a certain amount of surface area they can cover. So, yeah. Plus, they're in controlled areas, probably like some sort of a glass or plastic container, and then they can't get out of, probably. Well, there's that too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so obviously this sort of brings up a whole lot of things like pest control and stuff. Um, mm. there, are, there are cautions that will, you know, first of all, this is actually a quite high cost of the plant producing these toxins, so energetically speaking, it might not. There's a sort of a cost-benefit sum you've got to do here to see how much energy the plant is losing oh. to, to do this. Um, and also, apparently, you know, it's in some cases, like as, as I think someone who wasn't attached to the study said, look, this is great and everything, but um, caterpillars, <laughs> cannibalistic caterpillars might actually be selected for in certain cases. You know, more, more cannibalistic caterpillars might actually be something that would be bad for plants in the end in some way. Like, you know, it might, it, might, it might confer upon them certain other fitnesses that might be, in the end, bad for the plants. So okay. it's something to think about anyway. But, I mean, it's an interesting, interesting little study. It was a nice reaffirmation of something we already knew and then looking at how it affected behaviour in caterpillars, definitely. But 
and and something and something I didn't know either before I read this that yeah caterpillars can be cannibalistic and it makes sense when I think about other insect types but yeah it's also interesting um, this might be a recurring theme of tonight's show but um, when you look at the uh, I looked at a nature article and an article in the Guardian the nature article talks about that second experiment they did where they had just the one caterpillar and the dead caterpillars in the same set. Mm. The Guardian article doesn't seem to mention it at all, as far as I can see. <laughs> so. I think they, I think they talk about it just in much more general terms. Mm. So they, they, they don't describe the experimental procedure because, let's face it, it's a Guardian article, and they have Different this audience. idea that, yeah. yeah. I mean, I personally think that's a very interesting way of testing that. Mm. I mean, it makes sense. I, I mean, why do they? You know, they chose dead animals because they want to make sure there wasn't some sort of a, you know, a fighting thing or you know, like a an actual battle if you like okay. I guess that's why I mean I can't think of any other reason why they'd use dead caterpillars as opposed to live ones unless they actually wanted to measure how much animal material that caterpillar ate which actually that makes much, much more sense when I think about it because they'd like to know yeah like what's you know you start off with say six dead caterpillars how much of those caterpillars are, are eaten by the end of it and yeah it also it does show that it's not a I mean it's a behavioural thing but it's not like it makes the caterpillars more aggressive that they start attacking each other. It's more that they have the choice between two foodstuffs and they go for yeah. the less horrible tasting one. Yeah, presumably. yeah. I mean, and look, let's face it, it's, it's not proved either way. Like, you can't read the mind of a caterpillar. You don't know if they, you know, if they got a bit more, you know. <laughs> yeah, they've, they've thought it through more detailed. Yeah, you know. Or, 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 the, or they had, you know, it, it triggered a bloodlust. But I think what's generally <laughs> accepted here is that the plant matter is inedible or it's less nutritious or something like that. Yeah. And yep. probably, yeah, it probably tastes awful. So you'd much rather eat yourselves, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, eat other caterpillars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very cool. Uh, well, Lucas, we've talked a bit on the show before about CRISPR, the gene editing tool derived from bacteria that we can use to cut and paste gene sequences. Well, now, Seth Shipman uh, from Harvard Medical School has used CRISPR to encode an animated GIF of a galloping horse into the genes of bacteria, basically turning bacteria into a digital storage device. And I guess the question we're all asking, Lucas, is why on earth didn't he encode a cat video? <laughs> Surely that would be the first thing you'd go to. It's the it's, internet. <laughs> yeah. I suppose he didn't feel that that needed to be backed up because there's so many of them already on the internet <laughs> well this particular um apparently uh um there was uh, um, a, a series of photos of a running horse that was captured in 1872 by you know, it's uh, Aidwood. <laughs> it's a really weird way of saying it uh, Aidwood my my bridge captured a series of photos of a running horse and apparently at the time this was used to settle the, the, a long running debate as to whether horses or lift all of their mm. feet off the ground when they're running apparently mm -hmm. they do so um it then also became one of the very first m motion pictures, apparently. So that's kind of the reason why he chose this particular thing. There was there was another um, there was another uh, thing that was encoded too, not just this animated GIF, um, but also there was a, or GIF if you're of that uh, mm -hmm. persuasion. Although you'd be wrong. Um, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the 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 other one was a, I think a. a um, an image of a hand uh, was also also used. What what's interesting about this is, I mean, the the, the project here was was not about digital storage in in the traditional sense. It was it was not about inventing some way to to store information, although that was a, a side effect from it. The the um, the project was basically approached from from the uh, perspective of of neurology because they were. They were looking um, to uh, basically figure out um, a new way of studying how brains develop. Uh, so, you know, when and under what circumstances are genes activated and where and in which neurons and so forth. And apparently one of the, the difficulties with that is that every time you you, in, you interact with that system, every time you touch that system to, to measure it, you, you, you disrupt it, you cause changes or potentially cause changes so it's a little bit you know it's a little bit like the uh you know the, the issue with with um you know with quantum mechanics in terms of you mm -hmm. know knowing the location or the speed you can't know both sort of thing yeah um so 
so yeah, that that was the the approach. Is uh, looking uh, at ways of, of potentially, um, you know, adding markers that could be uh, could be used or encoded into living cells. And that's what's interesting about this is the fact that they they actually use living cells to to you know store this information because this sort of thing's been done before quite a number of times. In fact, I was surprised at how often this has been done. Um, there were a lot of different uh, projects going right back to the 90s, as far as I could tell. Um, like, for example, in 1999, they, they encoded, a, not this particular team, but uh, another team encoded a sentence from uh, the book of Genesis into a microbe in 2003. <laughs> a data scientist installed uh, store the lyrics of the song, It's a Small World, into uh, genomes of various bacteria. Um, well, they can use a better uh, song? The, Seriously? Come on. Yeah, <laughs> who knows why that no, was no, no. like... It's, a, it's ironic. It's a small... Anyway. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah but <laughs> but what, what was interesting about this is is in many cases they they effectively stripped um, the cell or stripped the DNA down into like a, a, a scaffolding and then, and then you know, wrote into it. Whereas in this case, they were using CRISPR to snip out little bits that are, that are normally used by the cells anyway. And Shane's much better to explain this part than I am. But, um, you know, these, um, the, this, this um, process is, is a part of the, this defense system of cells. Um, Shane, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I'm, yeah, I'm really sort of. very vague on that stuff. Look, to be honest, CRISPR is something that I, has eluded my whole understanding. Um, as far as I understand, it's basically a, the, the way it was used a bit originally was, you know, it's basically a storage device for, for bacteria to recognize certain motif sequences that are bad. Um, they store it in their genetic DNA. Like generally, viral DNA will be naturally incorporate itself into the bacteria's genome and take over the genome and basically start pumping out copies of itself. It basically it's, it takes over. But in this case, what it seems to do is that the bacteria will sort of store like it's almost like cassettes. Like it'll store like little sequences in a row, and then it will use that as like a recognition site. And as soon as something comes in that says, "Oh, oh wait a minute, that looks like that." That's when um, CRISPR, the, the gene, will come along and basically stop it from doing the anything. Enzyme. Uh, yeah, it's, sorry, the enzyme. Yep. Yeah, Cas9. Yeah, that's as far as that's as far as my understanding of it goes. To be perfectly honest, um, that's a pretty good summary, though. And, and you pretty much just summarized. You pretty much just summarized the Wikipedia summary page okay. on the top. <laughs> I was looking at it when you were uh, Which in I wasn't your own even words. Well at. done. <laughs> I wasn't even looking at it, but yeah, fine. <laughs> So, so yeah, this is you know part of the the, the cells you know natural defences anyway, um, and uh, so but what they managed to do was was inject this stuff and it, and and as Shane just said, it's sort of an array, it's like a line of or like a, a string uh, that it gets encoded into. So of course we've got you know we basically got four bits to use with with. Um, with DNA, whereas normally in binary we've just got zeros and ones. With 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 DNA, we've got four pieces of information to use: your A's, C's, G's, and T's of the double helix. So um, they figured out a way to encode it, whatever it was. It doesn't really matter as long as you can decode it. You know that that's that's not overly important. Um, but then the information was effectively distributed amongst different cells. And that, I think, is really, really cool because not only were they able to distribute the information amongst different cells, they were um, the cells then replicated that information. That's cool. That's really good. It's not a case of just writing into one cell and getting that cell back well, later. So, so my, my question is... Did, back up. But, did, but did, yeah. did, did they segment the information? Like, was it broken down to parts and only certain cells got... Or certain populations yes. of cells got parts of the message, or whatever, and then they that put it all correct. together. Yes. Right. So okay. it was like a RAID array in 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 storage terms, where you have mm. multiple disks that all have little bits of the information on it, and only together do they have the the complete picture. And so no one cell had the and whole thing. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but honestly, obviously, there's a way to put that back together in some sort of coherent way. Because yes, and yeah. and this is described uh, at a level that that. that eluded my understanding but basically um they said that uh it was also interesting that they didn't need to encode the um the order of these things because oh. when they when they um when they put all the information back together in and it might have been the way that they encoded it that that led to this outcome it didn't matter how they read it 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 was then decoded in the in the correct sequence in this case it was backwards because that's what they wanted for some reason um so it's it's okay. kind of cool that imagine if you could actually, you know, encode 
It's also a little bit worrying when you think of potential. Ma- imagine copyright information being written into cells and stuff like that. I, you know, I started mm-hmm. thinking about, um, you know, various interventions and medications and gene therapies and stuff like that. Imagine if they were copyrighted and if you received it and you were found to have a pirated version of it, <laughs> um, you know, you could be fined mm-hmm. or, or, or stripped of it or something. Uh, it sounds pretty pretty horrifying, but. Um, but yeah, that, that you know, well, to to be able to write information and have it replicated, um, and then distributed the way that it was is really cool. But what worries me though is mutation occurs, right? Amongst living cells. So what happens if you know in your replication, your message is changed, even slightly? You know, like one 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 cytosine is exchanged for a thymine, and then that changes that part of the message, and that happens regularly enough, that the message is corrupted. Yeah, there? and they, they did they they mentioned um, I can't remember the exact wording, but they did say that there there was no degradation of okay. uh, the encoding, uh, but that of course you know what we're talking about now requires generations. So I don't know how well, many there were in in, in terms of bacteria. Generation is like you know in, in say a case of you know E. coli growing on a plate that's like twenty minutes. So I guess yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. So it's not. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, mm. they said there was no degradation of the of the data, but um, okay. you know, it, it, then how do these how do these CRISPR arrays get rewritten naturally? Do they get snipped out and rewritten by other exposures? Because then maybe that would affect it. I'm not. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. To be honest. Yeah. If, but. If, uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, I was surprised because uh, uh, Shane and I were talking about this earlier tonight on on our um, Slack channel, and Shane's like, "Yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I'm not keen to do this one. You, you might, it might appeal to you more." It's like, really, CRISPR? I don't see how that, that, that would appeal to me. And I was like, "Oh wow, this is actually really cool." Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I did enjoy it. But um, but yeah, it's it's uh, very interesting where it could lead. It, it's really interesting because I think DNA makes a really good storage mechanism. It's amazingly small for a start, mm-hmm. and it is very durable. I mean, you know, we, we've talked before, um, it, it can last 6,000 years or so before it's unusable in terms of looking at the genome of uh, fossils and things. Yeah. And it, it just seems a lot more efficient than the uh, storage mechanism used in Rogue One, where you have to climb up the <laughs> big tower and all that, and you get the little slides around and the... It, yeah. it seems a lot more efficient than that. <laughs> that was odd, wasn't it? Because I remember thinking <laughs> with the pre-movie, like the trailer, that there was a there was a bit of footage in it that wasn't in the movie of of um, what's her name running with like a drive, right? And I'm thinking, no, it wasn't Ray. Not Ray, Nelson. it was um, oh. the other it was, um was yeah, um, Jin. Do you know so? Oh, uh, Jin. Yeah, yes. you know, yeah. yeah. She's she's running with this big drive. I'm thinking, surely. <laughs> Um, we've got better storage <laughs> now. Why? Yeah, but Lucas, it was in a galaxy I know it was a long far, time far ago. away a long time ago. So, you know, obviously their drives were crap. Come on. And it takes a lot of storage space to do something the size of a moon. I mean, that's a complicated piece of machinery. It can travel at hyperspeed. Uh, you know, may- maybe I was wrong. Maybe that is more efficient than DNA. Who knows? Yes. Well, I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe it was. Maybe it was a hollow. Maybe uh, who knows? I don't know. We're really off track at this point. But I agree. Yeah. DNA. I, I think there's, uh, as I say, I, I think there's a, an enormous potential with this. But also, you know, this kind of underlying <clears throat> sort of caution as well. Because again, I can see this going in that direction of these sort of uh, p- you know proprietary genes and so forth because mm-hmm. that could then be used for pesticides and all sorts of stuff it's case of ah you've got this one you need to now pay us royalties be, we'll end up with bloody patent wars over over crops Ugh, come yeah. on Lucas our courts and our uh, corporations have our best interests at heart <laughs> 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 Moving on. <laughs> You've broken Lucas. I have. Well, that that was, I, that well, was not the intention. That, that had a greater effect I know, than I imagined. That was the effect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's move on then and talk about ravens. They are very good for getting news between King's Landing and Winterfell. We've talked a lot about I don't, They never seem to make it. They never seem to. Oh, they get shot on. down by arrows all the time. And only during a war. Yeah, well, yeah. that seems to okay, be. Okay, well, let's am go. I, You're right. Am I the only person who's never seen Game of Thrones? Yes. yes. I am, aren't I? Yeah, all right, cool. Yes, and you're 
But we've talked a bit about how intelligent ravens are as well. They can use tools, they can solve basic puzzles. Uh, one has even been seen playing dead beside a beaver carcass to scare away other ravens from the meal. They're <laughs> Why didn't he just eat it? Surely that would have been a better... Because by the time he'd eaten the whole beaver, all the other ravens would have yeah, hoed in and eaten it all like up the, for him. Your Christmas meal situation. He's, maybe he wasn't playing dead. Actually, that's what it was. He was just it was a food coma. He'd eaten so much. Yeah, food coma. Yeah. And then he'd wake up just as they started. Oh, no, no, so, get so, away! So, 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 so just on a tangent, but by, by pretending to be dead, yeah. he was... Assu- we're assuming that the other ravens would be able to understand that a dead raven means that's bad and fly off. That's Again, cool. they're intelligent yeah. creatures. Oh. So they see, yeah. oh, he ate the beaver and died. I yeah. should probably not eat that beaver. Association. I, is that what it was? I, I just immediately assumed it was a case of, ah, oh, he's dead. Now we can have some of this. Oh, no, he's alive. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. I thought he would spring to life next. <laughs> no. So you're saying that they took it as a warning, like yeah, the raven was strung up on a fence that's, or something. That's mm. my interpretation. To be honest, I haven't read up in detail on that particular anecdote. <laughs> that was more just a passing example that I was providing before getting on to right. the meat of this story, which is that they've yeah, also... Isn't the beaver meat? Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Honestly, this is what I've got to do. I mean... <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> I can't remember what I was talking about. Now. <laughs> so the ravens, <laughs> um, they've now been shown that they can actually plan for the future. How does that work? I mean, how do we actually define yeah. that out? That's that's sort of my my major problem with this whole thing. Like, it's it's I'm not I'm not saying that the experiment experimentation wasn't ingenious and it didn't show that ravens are smart because hell it did like ravens are scarily smart they're definitely smarter than any dog i've ever owned um and yeah i know (laughs) and they're also they also seem to have cognition that in some ways according to these researchers and according to some of the things i've read as well seems to be on par with even toddlers which is amazing when you think about it um my problem is how they define well it's a bit of a philosophical problem like are the ravens actually thinking of the future as such, like as a concrete sort of concept, if you like? Um, <clears throat> and maybe, yeah, Luke, jump in any time, Lucas, because I think you and I have well, a Well, I think it's probably, yeah, it's probably a good time to sort of talk about what the experiment yeah. was or experiments. There were two primary ones, um, which related to um, a, a very basic, course they, they they had a learning period whereby they were exposed to a reward system that could only be activated by using a particular tool in this case it was a, a small pebble that uh, was only one particular pebble apparently that would um, if they put it into this tube would then release a little doggy treat for them which apparently they favor um, so they learned very very quickly um, that only this particular pebble would open it then um, the experimenters relocated the experiment, took the ravens to a different place. Um, There was a period of time in between the events. Um, The ravens were then offered uh, like a platter of of various things. And apparently the ravens um, favoured taking this particular pebble again, even though the food thing wasn't there at the time. Mm. And they would hoard it, they would hold on to it somehow in their raven pocket, I guess. And then later (laughs) on, when the food thing was reintroduced like 17 hours later or something, they'll go, ha-ha, I've got the pebble, I can stick it in the hole. And And then they would get the reward. But but here's my problem, though. Did they think that this pebble would later grant them access to this particular thing? Or were they just thinking, oh, I remember that being good, I'll hold on to it? I had exactly the same thought because it did issue. sound potentially very, you know, Pavlovian in terms yeah. of this. Um, okay, and, and also a bit you've conditioned a, like, a know, dog. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you've conditioned a dog to um, uh, to know that uh, this is actually a, a very much a part of training dogs. You yeah. you, you condition them with a reward. Yeah. yeah, association that if I do this, then something good happens, and then eventually you you don't have to reward them every time because they're so conditioned that something yeah. good happens when they do that. So it I I felt the same way, but. They also talked about these very same experiments, probably with some modifications for size and, and, and you know, the, the dexterous abilities being run with both apes, 
mm. don't know which, whether they were chimps or, or, um, I think or any of the other apes. Um, and also toddlers, four-year-olds. And they said that neither of those groups were able to to do this with anywhere near the degree of, um, uh, of, of uh, yeah. success. Yeah. Now, there was also another raven who said, you know what, screw you, goddamn pebble. <laughs> I have figured, this other raven figured out other ways to open this thing just by using bits of bark that it stuffed into it until it <laughs> added up to about the right volume, which then caused the thing. So that raven was subsequently excluded from the, um, uh, from the thing because so she, never learned, she never learned how important this pebble was. She just picked the lock. So, um, <laughs> so that was kind of funny. See, I think that's actually in some ways smarter than the rest of the bloody ravens, to be honest. But this is the thing. I mean, we already know that that, that ravens are very good problem solvers, and there's yeah. been some awesome, awesome experiments, um, and some of them, oh, we may have covered on the show. I can't remember. It becomes a problem. I forget what we've covered on the show and what I've just read as a part of you know, preparing for the show and what I've read just in science feeds. But there was one that I saw at some point not too long ago, it might have been six months or so ago, where a... Um, a raven was given a very complex set of of um, tasks that had to be completed before it got its reward, and they would they would quite routinely move things around and put them in different spots that were so it wasn't just a case of like a muscle memory sort of learned mm. I do this 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 it had to go searching for it was stuff. a series it had of to things figure yeah. stuff out it was a series of things and the series would change and and whatever and and they still you know these these um these ravens were able to to figure this stuff out and to problem solve through trial and error and whatever which is so we already know that they can do that but um, but what they were most you know interested in here was was planning for the future there was a second oh god this damn website's got some um, auto playing videos um the other experiment was uh was it, was delayed, what, what was it was like delayed gratification apparently so um yes that's right yeah, yes you apparently reminded me. yeah well i mean this is sort of what i mean when we were talking about this before i i thought yeah um i have problems with this I read this experiment. I'm like, oh, okay, that's a little bit more interesting. So here in this experiment, so we were, th- we were talking about the the token that would you know sort of that's represent right. food, and what these ravens, I think, after a series of training, were given a, a, an option here. They said, okay, you can take this token, which we've already associated with a really nice piece of dog kibble, or we can give you this smaller, less tasty piece of kibble. And the ravens, seventy percent of the time, actually chose the token. Which they could then trade. Which they can then trade for their better piece of kibble or wait for it to come along later. So that is a little bit more of an interesting um, association because that seems to suggest that they understand that, well, this is a better thing and it will come later. I could ignore. Yes. I could. I will ignore this piece of food right now, and that's the choice I've been given. And I will ignore that piece of food, and I will wait for the better one. And that's something. There's that's a, a famous experiment yeah. with um, uh, marshmallow toddlers. experience. Yes, yeah. You, did you? Did your mind go that's there? Exactly as well? where I was going. <laughs> I was going to say we need to Don't do a follow up in a few years' time to see if they're doing better at school, if they've got drug problems, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. As experiment where these these kids were, um, you know, basically taken into a room. They were alone, and they were told, "Okay, there's a marshmallow here. Um, you can eat the marshmallow." And you get a marshmallow. That's great. Um, but if you choose not to eat the marshmallow, you'll get two marshmallows later uh, or something along those lines. And then they would leave and the child would be left in there under video surveillance. And they would say, and so these videos are immensely amusing. Some of these kids look like they are struggling with the, the, the <laughs> deepest moral dilemmas that you can possibly fathom as they, they go through it. Some of them pick it up and smell it. Others are sort of, you know, they, they've got their heads down staring at the marshmallow. And you can see them thinking, oh, that looks so good. And quite a lot of them, quite a lot of them just can't resist and they eat the marshmallow, mm. even though they know they won't get two marshmallows later. Right. So, yeah, it was that delayed So, what was the success rate of that? Like compared to the ravens, like because the ravens apparently oh, no, <laughs> managed this seventy percent of the time. So what were the, what were the kids like? Like two percent, three percent? I, I <laughs> if had had the thought occurred to me prior to you starting the story, I would have looked that up, but I can't. I can't remember. <laughs> if my wife was here, she'd probably tell me. Yeah. Off my head, but yeah, I'm pouring actually... through the Wikipedia page, and I can't find anything about the results. It's all about the right. procedure and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> one one third deferred gratification long enough to get the second marshmallow. One th- so that's, that's yeah. terrible. Of, of those that are 70 to delay, 
Mm. One third oh. were able to delay long enough to get the second marshmallow. Mm. That's only of those who tempt who attempted yeah. to delay. So we don't actually know yeah. what the overall was. It says where seventy percent of friggin' ravens could do it. In over <laughs> six hundred children who took part in the experiment, a minority ate the marshmallow immediately. Of those that attempted delay, one third de- delay, uh, deferred gratification long enough to get the second marshmallow. And was that was that control for age or? Yes, uh, age was a major determinant of de- deferred gratification. The older they were, the better they were able to delay it. That makes sense. Yeah. No, uh, using children aged four to six. Okay, so not that big a deal, but uh, not that not that big an age difference, but yeah. yeah uh, but I think it makes a big difference at that age. There's I guess it must, huge yeah. developmental steps that oh, they yeah. take. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> I I just want to say that the kids who went, screw it, and just ate it immediately, I, I respect those kids. <laughs> I'm not going to play your game. Is that because I've got that's marshmallow what you right do? in front of me. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know. I think I I would probably be. I, I think I think. Well, it's hard to put yourself in the mind of a four year old, isn't it? But. But I, I reckon kudos to those kids. Good on them. <laughs> <laughs> Just not screw up, not playing your game. <laughs> so, look, what I find interesting about all these experiments with the ravens um, is, like, they, they talk about how a lot of these behaviours and a lot of these observed things are, are sort of unprecedented, but that's not entirely true. Um, there's a There was a researcher called Irene Pepper, Pepperberg, I think her name was, um, and she researched... Back in the 70s, and she wasn't even a, an animal behaviourist or anything like that. She was actually a chemist. But she developed an interest in birds, and especially specifically African grey parrots. Now, if anyone's ever read up on an African, African grey parrot, they are scarily smart um, and also bastards, apparently. But, <laughs> they, they're, they're, but they're basically, yeah, they're very, very, very intelligent birds. And she had a special one called Alex, and, and there's a whole book based on her work with Alex called Alex and Me. And it's quite fascinating. Um, I'd like to read some of her original papers because – so she was working at a time where – during the 70s where, you know, women researchers were, you know, poo-pooed anyway. She was working in a field that was not her own. She was struggling to get tenure and even her husband, who was a fellow researcher, was apparently sort of saying, well, can't you just do what you're trained to do, which is be a chemist, not, you know, fiddle with birds. But she developed a whole lot of things, a whole lot of understanding about um, bird intelligence – to the point where this bird apparently understood the concept of nothing, zero. Like it understood. Wow. The, yeah, it, it's read the book if you can. There have been whole civilizations that didn't know <laughs> exactly, zero. right? Yeah, but but he, this bird understood. He understood the concept of you know one thing and zero things. He understood the concept of bartering. He understood the concept of um, you know sort of um uh, well preening for the camera apparently because he <laughs> he would turn on his best abilities when he was being followed by a camera crew. Apparently, <laughs> um, and even like he understood phonics. I, if if my, my wife was here, she'd understand, be able to explain this a bit better because she was fascinated by this because she's one of her special um, interests is phonics in children, and this bird understood phonics, how to sound out words. He had the language abilities that were equivalent to those of a two-year-old child, and the problem-solving skills of a five-year-old. Yep. As a, Which, bird. As, a, as a bird, as a bird. Now this is, so, and this is all. This is all, this, this. All her work was done in the seventies, and I think the eighties. So this is a long, long time ago, and so it's. I think, I think if this sort of comes up every now and again. People are sort of surprised by how intelligent birds are, and and how this sort of has a this should cause a rethink in our ideas of animal intelligence and human exception, exceptionalism, but. A lot of this work was already done a long, long time ago with a different species of bird, granted, but still, it's. I think it's interesting and we should look back on this a bit more. So, mm. yeah. It also made me think um, back to the the very early days of the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast when uh, Perry and Steve always used to argue about the which was the more intelligent uh, uh, out of birds and, uh, and, and monkeys. Monkeys. But, um, yeah, that's what <laughs> reminded me of that long-standing feud. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, th- I think we have a kind of a bias against animals that don't have hands and, and things yeah. like that. Like, they they have difficulty in communicating or, or demonstrating things all the time. You, oh, look at dolphins, for example. We, t- we tend mm. to go, oh, yeah, they're really smart, but, you know, they're not that smart. Well, I mean, we can't really... 
do many good conclusive tests to determine things like that just because of their anatomy if anything in terms of yeah. communication and their total and unwillingness to to um you know to communicate go to school back yeah. to us yeah they they <laughs> they're quite capable of learning quite a lot of our words and phrases and so forth this has happened but we're yet to learn any of theirs like nah. you know, it's just <laughs> they they just don't share frankly <laughs> kind of assholes <laughs> I think we've gotten a long way off the original topic. Here. <laughs> I love thinking about birds and their relationship with dinosaurs, and just think how smart mm. those guys could have been. You know, just think of some of the some of the um, theropods that that are in yeah. their lineage there's, oh, with much bigger brains. Finally, or, or, funny you should mention that. There's a there's a I'm going to go off, right off the tangent. There's a Star Trek Voyager episode. Now that show sucked, but. There was a very interesting episode. I loved Voyager. What are you yeah, talking about? Don't get Voyager me was good. Don't get me started. Except on how for a bad few Voyager key was. episodes, like the lizard. Like, anyway, like, like all of them. Sorry. Um, anyway, <laughs> Janeway was a really good captain. No, she wasn't. She was a terrible captain. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna and I'll argue. That right in. Give us your thoughts. If you thought Janeway uh, was a great captain, email us. Let she, me look, know. she she she, <laughs> she was occasionally a great captain, but she made some horrible command decisions. Actually, a lot of horrible command decisions. Anyway, the point is that there's an episode called I think. Oh, I think it was called past lineage or something like that, and it's basically it poses the question: what ha- what would have happened if dinosaurs were actually smart enough to escape Earth, travel to the Delta Quadrant, and become a civilization all on their own? And, Seriously? Yeah, yeah, and, and and they come across these dinosaurs, and it's actually quite a fascinating. My problem with Voyager is that it didn't ha- it didn't pose a lot of those philosophical questions that other Star Trek did, but this episode did, and it was about you know, um. It was about doctrine of the dinosaur people versus the reality. And I, I, I don't want to spoil it too much, but it was a really fascinating episode. And, yeah, and I can't remember what it was called. <laughs> if it's some, not yeah. lineage. It's not past lineage. It was – oh, God. Okay, I'm was, looking up Star Trek dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of the weirdest searches I've I know. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I think Distant it's, Origin. This, that's the one, yeah, Distant Origin. Um, it's It was a really good episode. It Yeah, it – my, my oh, I, terrible series. I, I, I had problems with some of their. Um, there was a certain bit in that where they took evolution and totally mangled it, which they Star Trek often does. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah every, right. you've made me think of a, a, a novel series that I read by uh, Larry Niven, which is the the uh, started with a book called The Bowl of Heaven, which was um, set in some you know distant future where humans are are actually setting <clears> off on their first interstellar journey and they they ha- they're heading towards a a particular planet that was deemed uh, or a particular system that was deemed appropriate to to recolonize one of the ex- exoplanets there yeah. and um on their journeys they 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 caught up with um a, a, what turns oh is this spoilers i don't know it's been <laughs> out a long time suddenly i'm worried about talked spoiling about it before people. on the show i think i have yeah I haven't, I haven't right, sorry this. I don't think if you're planning to read bowl of heaven just you know skip the next you know, thirty seconds or so. But basically, yeah, there was this this massive um, uh, bowl shaped um, uh, spacecraft that had been built by the dinosaurs of Earth, the intelligence mm. ones who had since left. And they had during their journeys, they had actually evolved into birds. Um, on this thing. <laughs> so they were massive birds, but they they were harnessing the power of a star that had that they had captured um, and and set this thing up. It was really really an intriguing sort of uh, look of case of well, yeah. The the ones, the ones that went extinct were the stupid ones. They, they, didn't, they didn't leave. Yeah. <laughs> They're the ones that didn't have a space program. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. I think we are well and truly done with the animal <laughs> science stories that we were talking about. <laughs> and if you want more information, all the links to those stories and probably some Star Trek stuff and whatever <laughs> will be in the show notes and on the Alex web. Alex and me, don't forget that. Alex and me, great book, yes. They'll all be on the web at scienceontop.com slash 272. Uh, let us know what you think. Do we ramble on too much about tangents and things that aren't relevant? Or, <laughs> yeah, sorry, guys. <laughs> or do you actually think Janeway was a great captain? Let us know. <laughs> and if you do, you're wrong. But anyway, that's fine. <laughs> and if you like the show and all our ramblings, if you want to help us make more, go to scienceontop.com slash donate. Uh, sign up on Patreon. Thanks for joining me today, Shane and Lucas. No worries, mate. No worries. Thanks. This episode was edited with two ravens, a cannibal caterpillar, and a giant block of ice by <laughs> Marcos Benamou. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then.
Uh, however, the, the most important thing was if Mars, can I, uh, I ask permission for one minute for, for this question, and that is you have indicated that Mars had a, uh, was totally different thousands of years ago. Uh, is it possible that there was a civilization on Mars thousands of years ago? So the evidence is that um, Mars was different billions of years ago, not billions thousands of years ago. Well, yes, that. and and um, there would be there is no evidence that uh, I'm aware of that. Would you that, rule? Would you rule that out? That see, there's some people. Well, anyway, with, I would it, I would say that is extremely unlikely. Okay. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Brothers. Thanks for the good job you're doing. God bless.